House needs paint. Grass needs mowing. Where's he at? Hi, this is Hank. Sorry I missed your call. Leave me your name and your number and I'll get back to you. He's gone fishing. Well, hello and welcome to Hank Parker Off the Water. I have my lovely co-host, my granddaughter, Sarah Beth. Hello. And I have my friend and business partner, friend first, business partner second, Danny Bennett, my buddy Danny Bennett. And uh, we're going to have a very, very hot, flashing, fiery show today. Uh, we're going to hit a topic. And the reason I brought Danny on for this particular show is he's very passionate about fishing. And he's concerned about the future of fishing, and he's been asking some really tough questions. And I said, well, come on, and we'll just knock it out. I don't like controversy, but it's something that we're going to have to deal with. Oh, I hope so. Yeah, so we'll do that. Now, Sarah Beth, I said Danny was my business partner. What's that mean? Well, uh, you and him work together for the high school fishing team, bringing awareness to that and trying to get an organization together, right? That's good. That's exactly right. And let me tell you, that's coming along. We're going to be talking about that uh, in just a few more days, and uh, it's exciting. We're going to get teams signed up. We've already got a, a handful or two um, teams signed up, and uh, we haven't even launched yet. So we got some pre-registration. That's exciting. Pre-registration. You can go to alphabetapparel.com now and click on web stores and uh and uh, we really not advertise that very much. And I was very, very pleased when we checked yesterday the number. So uh, this is good. We're shooting for at least 6,000, and uh, we're on the way. Man, that is great, and uh, I'm excited about it. Hey, yesterday I talked with Gary Nesty at uh, Solar Bath, and, of course, my favorite pair of sunglasses that I wear is HP3. It's H. Parker 3. And uh, I think they're awesome glasses, an incredible value for a lot less than most fishing glasses, and they perform just as well. And so I talked to Gary yesterday, and he said, I admire what you guys are doing for high school fishing. I think that's something we all need to be a part of. I said, well, I bet you'd be a part of it. And he said, I'll do that. What, what do I need to do? And I said, you need to let these high school guys sell your glasses and make $30 on every pair they sell. And he thought about that, and he said, that hurts, but I'll do it. So he's in. So we're going to have uh, Nate Parker Solar Met sunglasses. Okay, good. Good. So we got a lot going on. What do you think that's there, man? That's awesome. It's really good news. Yeah. You like those sunglasses? Yeah, I think they're cool. Yeah, you're supposed to say they're my favorite. Yeah, I do. Oh, yeah, they're my absolute fake. I feel a little bit to see just um, fast forward a couple of years and we see these companies join and just to have been able to be a part to form all of that and get that going and see the support, see the, but what, what, what we've talked about, the point in this entire venture. Well, you know, and you and I have talked about this behind the scenes, but I think this is really important. Uh, we're, we're living in a society that our young generation has been taught by the performance of our own government that there are so many programs that we're going to give you this, we're going to give you this, you're entitled to this. And, and I think we need to stop and rethink. We're not entitled to anything. We, we, you got to earn your keep and uh, you, you got to work. And it's only fair work. It's not fair to mooch off of anybody. And uh, so I think it can teach these kids uh, how to work a little bit. If you want your team to be funded, uh, then get out and sell a hat, sell a hoodie, sell a T-shirt, sell a pair of sunglasses. Uh, do some things to sustain yourself. Earn your keep. And I, I think it's going to be a good lesson for the kids, and I think it's going to be a great opportunity. And there's a lot of money to be made for these schools, and they need this money. Right. So it, it's a program that I'm hoping will take off and really work and serve the purpose. Well, you know, just the basic structure that we've lined up with. I mean, every school, a twenty-man school, should be able to raise three to four thousand dollars easily, just for what we've got. I think so too. Yeah. I really do. And that's substantial. Listen, that 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 takes care of a a lot of expense uh, for a handful of um of tournaments. So yes, yeah. it. There is a lot of need, Sarah Beth. There is a lot of need for these schools, but uh, the first one is to get the funds to be able to maintain and operate. Yeah, I could see that. Um, I mean, even whenever I was in school, I mean, I was homeschooled, but I was a public school for 
certain portions. One of our music programs got completely shut down, but it was all due to funding. Nobody gives to the schools anymore, or they give you these like little small chocolate bars to sell, but are about what a dollar a chocolate bar. So, okay, what is this gonna buy us? What instrument is this possibly gonna buy when each instrument's going for about three to four hundred dollars a piece? Yeah, and then that's the same issue. So, I like what the bands did because they built the foundation and made me think about being self sustaining. And uh, so, it was their, their model that I, I took. Uh, to begin with, it has worked for them. They sell chocolate bars and wrapping paper and all this different stuff. It's a great idea. It's just not enough money for these for these schools to be able to, to buy gasoline at the price for their bass clubs to to be the boater. You know, I mean, there's so many issues. It's not we're not going to fix all the problem by helping them raise money, but it's the number one issue. So we'll get that one done. And then we'll take on the other challenges, but we've got to make high school fishing work. It is our future, and it's important to our generation, not only just to the fishing industry, to our guys, to our kids, to our young people as a whole, to get them something real and tangible, something they can touch and feel and experience. And so I think it's really important on what we're doing, and we got to make it work. Absolutely. I'm all about work. Listen, I know, I know, you know, the hard way. You, you know, it's biblical. I mean, we, we got work. <laughs> we talk about fishing and how important it is when I was a kid. You know, I mean, I advanced and I got into tournament fishing and I think that's wonderful. And I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunities I had to be a tournament fisherman and the money that I made and was able to make a living and do it what I love to do. But that's truly not what fishing's all about. And that's not the foundation that got me involved in fishing. It was when my dad would get a shovel, we'd go dig some red words, and uh, uh, the bobbers on the back of the pickup truck blowing in the wind and the, the excitement and getting to the pond or the creek or the lake and, uh, and setting your bobber and watching that thing go under and the excitement and the thrill and the preparation and the camaraderie and all the things that's involved, that's what made fishing so wonderful to me. And it became my escape as I got older, you know, and I was so bound by school and things that I didn't want to do. And, and my dad and our home life got chaotic. Man, I escaped at the lake watching that bobber and uh, so that's what fishing really means deep down to me that's the foundation that we've built on and I think we need to stay with that I think we need to stay within the boundaries of the thrill uh, and the camaraderie of, of the sport itself I completely agree um I mean I got to grow up seeing fishing as a family a family thing Getting together, it was our first guy to to fishing was the family fishing show. And, I mean, we didn't use any technology, anything. We just, we sat on a riverbank and we fished. We about threw a bubble and sang by getting our line ball. You got 15 of us sitting there. But, uh. We don't want, we don't want to talk about this often. She killed me. I, she had real throw me up in the bus in just a minute. I see it coming. They're trying to manage about 12, 13 grandkids, all throwing up in the trees, throwing over each other, tagging up lines. I mean, man, it was, it was organized chaos, but we laughed and we, we cried and, and we had a good time. I had a really good time. And to say that's some of my fondest childhood memories. And I mean, it really meant a lot. So, I mean, I feel like people lose sight of that or people aren't lucky enough to have that in their life. They, they just don't know. But I appreciate that, and I think that's good. She mentioned, Danny, that there was no technology involved. And yeah, that's what we're going to talk about today, technology advancement. Uh, uh, I know you have your opinion. You and I have discussed this behind the scenes, and I realized before we get involved in this, this is a hot topic. It's, uh, it's one that I kind of thought I would... Uh, skirt around and and not go there i always want to stay positive uh i think fishing needs to be positive i think the outdoors is positive i think there's enough uh controversy in the tabloids so if you want to if 
you want to get involved in a bunch of, of uh, controversy and chaos, just go by and you know, inquire and, and read the headlines. Uh, I, I want to say, but this is a topic that is necessary to engage in because, uh, as Bob Dylan would say, the times they are a changing. And so we need to figure out the best way to uh, to make this transition, to make this change, to make sure that uh, we don't uh, mess up our sport and we don't do anything that's unfair. We stay within the parameters of fairness to everyone involved. But preservation of the sport is extremely important. So with that being said, I'm going to look to you, Danny, and uh, let you open up this can of worms and, uh, and see see where we go with her. Well, I, I certainly appreciate that. You know, but <laughs> nobody knows me, so Kyle, this is how we get to be introduced. So let me, so full disclosure, he doesn't tell me anything. I have no idea what we're talking about. Um, so I, I don't, yeah. this is totally unscripted, off the cusp. And I'm telling him behind the scenes, listen, well, I need to write down questions. He said, no, I, will, I want your passion. I want you to tell me from your perspective to where we are. So in doing that, I'm going to back up real fast. Part of the reason that we're here today is because of passion. It's because of, of a question. What is fishing? Okay. Both, I, I've heard testimony now from both of you about what fishing is. Well, I don't have enough time in this podcast to go into it, but when we speak of fishing and hunting in the outdoors, I am very passionate about it. And let me tell you why. I grew up with some challenging circumstances, to say the least, um, one of which my dad was never never in the picture. And I um, uh, grew up in some, you know, some, some turmoil at times, and um, I had two of the best grandfathers ever. And one of those grandfathers in particular was... Uh, the pictures, and, and even he lived to be 95, but he invented, and the pictures that I have uh, of him and the times that we spent together is part of the fabric that made me. It's my character. It's my integrity. I've, I've had an opportunity to speak with my daughters about how you used to could just go and be unplugged. There were no cell phones, what that meant, uh, walking the bank of a pond. And for me, when life got really bad around me, that was my escape. Just about every day, I had a little small pond in my front yard, and I had a really big pond, uh, CSX Railroad, that's in my backyard. And so they dug this long uh, pond for purposes they needed dirt. But I had literally just about, I mean, there were there were hardly ever weeks other than the dead of the winter that I did not spend hours daily fishing. It meant something to me. It still means something to me. And I, I dreamed of being a dad and teaching my daughters that. I dream now of being a granddad. So I, I listen, heritage matters. Uh, the sport matters. And we've got to back up first and foremost before we go into, you know, we watch these trends. We watch people, whether it's politics, you know, statements come out. And, and listen, no matter whether anyone voices their opinion or not, we've all got opinions. We did. You're dancing around this about as good as possible. Or jump on in, boys. The water is fine. All right. So here's the deal. We got opinion, and when and when these things come out of life, we want to we want to what just things, we want to be quiet. So when forward facing comes out, oh yes, the trend. Here's the trend. Really? We doesn't mm-hmm. really kick back on it, right? We see the kickback. Well, what kickback? Sure. Sponsors don't like it. People don't like that. They don't look good representation. So now the trend, you know, we got the the truth at the beginning of this. We got we got the right angles. Now you're starting to see a trend where we bounce back. And when the first high profile angler comes up and says, "Hey, I've either got to get on board, shut up, or get out of the way, or get beat," and then the next one says that, and the next one says that, and I get it. Listen. I am irrelevant, but I'm not irrelevant. I make up about 94% of the angling community at either as me. I've got a perspective on it. And and we've got to back up and say, what's this all about? Why are everybody's feathers ruffled? So I'm going to bounce back for you from that. Why do you think they are? Well, I think, first of all, we have to put it in perspective. And there is some changes that are being made that appears to be very dangerous. 
Uh, it, it can literally rearrange the sport itself. And so there are some issues here that need to be addressed. And I think the sanctioning bodies are the people that are ultimately going to step up and make decisions to preserve the sport or either uh, continue to let technology override all the traditional methods of fishing. So it is a pivotal time, and it's a, it's a crossroads that can lead uh, to a very negative situation. So the passion that you have for the sport, now I will say this, off camera, we've had a lot of discussions back and forth on, uh, on what's taking place and uh, all the tournaments that are setting new records, uh, breaking the 100-pound mark, and just incredible catchers. Uh, and it is all contributed, for the most part at least, to forward face and so on. And uh, so I think forward face and so on have some Incredible benefits. I think it's I agree. technology that has rocked my world. I've learned so much. And I'll give you an illustration. I watched a fish on a stone, and he stayed there, and I was going to cast to him. And before I could even cast, he swam away from that stone that went over around in the direction of a boat dock. Now, whether or not he went to that boat dock, I don't know. I couldn't find him. I couldn't find him for a while. And so I just... Uh, I took my, uh, at that time I was running Talon, so I just Talon down them, and uh, I just sat there, and I'm on alert. Where did that fish go? And so I'm trying to find that fish, and just a few seconds later, I look, and he's back on that stump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm waiting a minute, and I'm going to cast to him, and, well, he leaves that stump again, and he goes in the direction of another boat dock. So I'm thinking, I'm going to find him. So I'm scanning, looking for him, looking for him, and I can't find him. And just a few minutes later, he's back at that stump. I would have never thought fish move like that. You know, if you watch a shark in a tank or watch a shark uh, as they do all this underwater video and they put out food, they continually circle. I think a bass has got some of that in him. You know, when I used to fish farm park, you'd sit there and watch bass circle that farm park. Yeah. You'd be there and that one come by and maybe a wolf pack. Or, yeah, a uh, wolf pack. Yeah, and then sooner or later, here they come back again. Yeah. I think that happens on the lake. I never knew that, and I would have not ever known that had it not been for that forward face of Zohar that I was trying to learn. And I, and I will tell you this, I stink at it. Mm -hmm. I've spent, yeah, I spent two and a half years trying to learn, and I'm not very good at it. So these kids that are good at it, they're brilliant. They're really smart. They are really good anglers. So I think a lot of people are trying to discredit their ability. Uh, it's just ability, their ability is in a different direction maybe than someone else as, as traditional fishing has gone. But as far as them being great fishermen or uh, great anglers, smart, hey, I'm going to take my hat off. They're blowing me away, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. Well, and blowing, blowing everybody away, which is which is part of the part of the controversy, part of the question, and and I want to be I want to be very very clear about this. So I have forward facing on my boat, okay. So I'm not just totally against it because let let's look from my perspective for a moment. I'm an angler that enjoys it, but I just don't get butts of lunchtime on the water. All right. So if you show up and you're on these large high pressured lakes and you don't have three days to pre fish and figure it out. You're like me, you're a working man with a lot of irons in the fire, and you show up. Listen, that forward-facing sonar can help you piece that puzzle together much quicker. It can help you have funner days on the water. It's not going anywhere. I think the question here is, um, how do we put it in perspective? Uh, you made a comment in one of our talks recently, and you said, uh, one thing about in your day, and if you recall this, you said it was a level playing field. I'd like to discuss that just a moment because as we are really considering these young anglers and these high school anglers, I have many friends that um, I have grandfathers. I have dads that are fishing with their children, with their grandchildren. They're trying to get them into the sport. And I'm hearing a lot of discouragement as they go out and they come in and they just don't feel the ability to compete. Now, when you get to the elites and you get to the professional level, 
that's a little different, although I still think there should be some containment. There needs to be some lines in the sand there as well. But right now, how is this one of my key concerns? How is this affecting our young people in that there literally can be, just say one of my daughters fished. I've got five units on my boat. I've got forward-facing sonar. Just the idea of that greatly discourages many of these other young anglers. And if we come in and we caught fish, they immediately say, well, I don't have that land, I, I, therefore I can't get fish. And that, that could turn that angler away. They could have potentially been a very, very good angler. It's just, where do we start there? What do you think about that, sir, Beth? I feel like it's a pro and a con at the same time. It's a pro as in it's a new technology and you do open new doors. You might learn something new about this animal. I mean, you're hunting something that is alive. They have patterns. They have different, you know, different things that they do, different conditions that they live in. So if you know that, I feel like you're kind of kind of set in an instance, and I feel like that can get open doors that you can learn that a little bit better. But let me ask you this. If you take that away, can you still do the same thing and know where to look for those? You know, when I fished on the tournament circuit, Deke Thomas came along from California. He called it tooty dip, and later it was caught flipping. And to watch him, and David Gleeby also was a protege um, of uh, uh, D, who came from Stockton, California, and uh, they brought this flipping technique to life. And you're sitting there watching a the guy that put this little cup in a swimming pool, and, he, and they could flip a jig and make it land in that little cup. Mm -hmm. Man, I could have come up there, and I couldn't hit a manhole, let alone that little cup. Mm -hmm. It's just intimidating to watch how good these guys were. But it was something that I went home and I learned. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't long till I could flip in that little cup. Mm -hmm. It took practice and practice and practice. But that was on me. It wasn't something that I had to go home and, and raise $50,000 to be able to compete. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are right now, whether we like it or whether we don't. On my boat, I have about $32,000 worth of electrons. Uh, a lot of these guys are running four and five transducers with forward-facing sonar, and they literally, I, I, I watched Zaldine's uh, podcast the other day where he were interviewing these different guys with quick, and I'm telling you, the vast majority of them, and they were, they were low-balling how much all this stuff cost at retail, but it was well over 50000 on a lot of these folks. That in itself is going to cause some issues, especially on the lower levels. Uh, the the maybe not the elites and maybe not the major league fishing guys, but the guys that are a tier down the ladder. There, it's going to create real issues for the high school fishing teams trying to have electronics to compete. So that's where we get into the point of not a level plating. Okay. So there are all these angles. Let's start right here. Now, this is so you put me on the spot, I get to put you on the spot. Okay. Here's what I don't know behind the scenes professionally. I, I have no idea how it works. So is there not an incentive for anglers? Because we saw some that had seven 12-inch units on their boat. Okay. Seven. Okay. Now, is there not an incentive if that angler, and I don't know how it works. I'm just going to just draw out the air. If he gets these units for half cost, if he can put seven He's making that much more money, right? Just say he can make $1,500 on resale when he sells that boat. If he can squeeze seven units on there times $1,500, that's a lot more than if he only had four units. Is, is that an angle? That's possible. I haven't even thought about that. That is a That's an angle that's definitely possible, and especially if he has a full-ride sponsorship where he gets his units at no cost, then that's really going to, Oh, Pat, the kid, exactly. You seven units, seven transducers. Because when you rub that mic, you're fifty, sixty thousand dollars. If that's a full ride, look what he just added to you. He just had an entire sponsor for free, so to speak, right? Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, and, and I'm not sure that that is really uh, a big part of the equation. Here's where I'm looking at it. We try to entice high school fishermen to go out and uh, and have fun. 
and we try to get them to understand the thrill of the sport, something that's real. You can play fishing games on your cell phone, but it's not the same as smelling the air. It's not the same as feeling the breeze and the, and the, the heat of the summer. It's not the same as being out there and doing the real thing. So now are we going to convert that into just sitting there staring at a screen all day? You're not watching that bald eagle fly over. You're not watching that blue heron in the back of the cove. You're not seeing any of that. You're zoned out because your technique is completely dependent upon your eye contact on that screen and watching your lure go to that fish. So now all of a sudden, you, you may as well be in sight. You may as well be in the Coliseum or in your living room because you're zoomed in on that screen just as if it's a computer screen. And so now your whole world is right there in front of you on your electronics watching your bait and watching the fish, watching the bait ball, trying to figure out how to get your bait to make the right presentation and stay in there with that narrow zone of forward facing. And that's your whole world. And to be good at that, you've got to zone the rest of all these distractions out of your way. You've got to focus on being proficient at getting that bait to that fit. So all of a sudden, everything has changed. It is no longer Look at that fish. I saw a fish swirl over here. I saw this bait junk. I did this. All that's zoned out. If you're going to be really good, you need to keep your eye on that screen. I don't like that. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying I personally don't like that. When I go, it's a package deal for me. It's being out there. It's enjoying Nature, it's watching my surroundings, it's watching the deer run down the bank, it's watching the eagle fly over, it's the osprey diving to catch bait, it's the shad moving and a fish fish breaking. It's all that experience together that makes it so refreshing and so real to me. Just to stare at a screen, I did the commentary last year for the first two days for the web uh, for BASS. It was extremely difficult for me to watch the top four or five anglers staring down at a screen. They didn't even look up. They're casting. Yeah. They're not even looking up. Well, had I not been obligated to do in commentary for that particular classic, I wouldn't have watched that. Mm -hmm. To me, it was boring as it could possibly be. So if I'm in the entertainment business and I'm trying to sell people on watching my television show and I'm bored them to death, they're going to turn it off. Okay, so pause right there. So if you do a little research, what you'll find right now is they say, no, 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 you're wrong. We've got the best ratings we've ever had. Now let's think just a moment. Okay. Too many times we jump the gun on this thing. There may be, you know, one of the reasons this year, they had very, very little bit of that last year, but this year now they're starting to get some screenshots, some camera angles where you can watch them presenting that bait. Let me tell you why people are tuning in at the moment for that. Because so many of us went out and purchased it and were horrible at it, like myself. And I want to see what there's, I want to see how they do it. I want to say, I'm watching them, you know, we are with these spinning rods with all these guys. And, and, you know, shaking it and, and um, you know, working it in. And I've tried to, I'm learning. You know why? Because as a true bass fisherman, that's what you do. You want to learn. You want to take. But here's the thing. Once we cross that threshold, once, folks, once that new wears off, what I fear is this is when we're going to see the back. What I'm thinking about is this. Like I said, I do not, I have so much respect for these young guys and, and these older guys that are learning it. I love the sport. I don't want to be devil's advocate. I don't want to be the bad guy. I love all of these guys. I Listen, I grew up watching you. I grew up watching, I hate to start naming names because I like all these guys, whether it's Hackney, Flippin', whether it's Ben Milliken now doing his thing. Well, back in the day, you've got Andy uh, Morgan or, or both Andys, you know, sk Skip and Dots. 
all of these things, Kevin Van Dam, goodness gracious, all of these people that I grew up with, that's part of it. And you learn to be versatile. What I like, what I'm attracted to about the sport is what makes this sport work is, um, you remember the old movie, Any Given Sunday. Well, any given Saturday, I have the ability to go out and win a tournament. Okay, and that's the backbone of bass fishing or your local clubs, your local derbies. And I go out, and you know what I like about it? I've always prided myself for being a really good outdoorsman. Well, that's true, and I don't know, but I've told myself that. All right, when I go out, I've got to pay attention when I walk up to what the water looks like. When I'm on the lake running down, that I've got to see where the best clarity is or not if I want to fish stained water. I've got to notice the wind direction. If I'm fishing and it's still and sunny, all of a sudden clouds blow in, the sun's covered up, I'm going to a windblown point. I've got to change. I'm fishing the moment. That's what makes up bass fishing. I'm not saying you need none of those skills to, to do forward facing successfully. You do need some of them. They're looking for some of those points, and they're looking. They've got to know where those fish are right now spawning. But that's that's nothing front page news. If you know that, now what it's boiling down to is how well they're able to see their bait. After that, presenting that bait, I think the biggest struggle, at least with myself, I can't see my bait and the fish do it. And there's that learning curve. I don't get enough time on the water to do it. If I did, I think I'd be good. So let's talk about the back side of it. When the new wears off of this, where will we go? And because I'm telling you, um, I'm an avid bass fisherman, so I tune in while I'm at work. I've got it played in the back room. Just It's not because what they're doing is so awesome. I just love bass fishing. I want to hear the commentary. I, I just want to be in that world. So does everybody else watching this. But what's going to happen in the future where we just... That's going to get old. Well, it's obvious what's happening. If you look at what took place at Lake Fork, there was nobody competitive that uh, was not using forward face of solar from my perspective. And I, I stand to be corrected because I, I don't watch as much as, as some people, and I don't know everything, and I don't claim to it. But from what I saw, uh, you were not competitive unless you were looking at that stream. And in doing that, you can't blame the guys that are winning the tournaments by doing that because it's competition. And so your job as a competitor is to win. And if that's what it takes to win, that's right. then shame on you for not adapting and not doing that. That's right. But what is that doing to the sport itself? What is that going to do five years from now, ten years from now, if that is all there is? And you should not even fool with a spinnerbait. You shouldn't even throw a lipless crankbait. You shouldn't even worry about flipping or fishing up in the shallows. You shouldn't worry about any of that. You just look at that screen because that's the way to win. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen generation after generation if that's where we're going? And let me just say this, and this is the part that's really scary. This stuff's in its infant stage right now. Yeah. Technology is going to roll. There's going to be a short time frame from now that you'll have an identification on the screen that says largemouth bass seven times. I mean, that's not hard technology compared to what they've already developed. So it won't be long. It's going to identify species and how much they're going to weigh. Listen, when the richest man in the entire world Elon Musk says and warns very strongly about AI, artificial intelligence, when he says, I will only allow my companies to touch that so much because it's dangerous. Is it convenient? Yes. I watched a video of Andy Morgan talking about how it used to on the tournament trail, and you would relate to this. You better have an atlas. I mean, just getting from one tournament to the next in and of itself to the right boat ramp was a challenge, right? Now, you just key in your little deal on your smartphone. So is technology, can technology be good? Can it be convenient? But listen, there is nothing that we don't have a line in the sand other than bass fishing. If you don't believe that, watch Chris Salvain's video. It's, it, I mean, all he did was stuck it in front of us to see it. And, and that, that, there's no limit. No end of soldier. Uh, it, it's it's whatever, however, and that's what bothers me. We're not, and and now part of that argument is this: these guys, when you what you know, they're so talented, and they are. Listen, these these say that these young guys that just came on the elites, hands down. I mean, I they they know what they're doing. Here's my question that I'd like to pose, not a statement, 
I'm not taking anything. They would fish me in the dirt. These guys are awesome. I want to be super clear about that. But they are that awesome because forward facing is relatively new. Now, you watch a video and say, oh, people say it's seven years old. Listen, it's only been relative throughout the tournament industry for two seasons. Yes, it has been around for seven years. Just go back and watch your tournaments, okay? It it was it didn't play a factor other than with a select few. So when we talk about studies and you watch some of these people bring these arguments and they talk about, oh, what's the news? It's been around. For no, no, no. It it has technically been around. It has not been a player, okay? So when we look at this with these young folks, all right, fast forward five years. Let's say it this way. The 12, 13-year-old right now, that has when when he is nineteen and old enough to qualify for the elites like some of these did this year, he will possibly only ever have known forward facing zonar. He may not have a spinner back and crank bait in his tackle box. The guys now do because that's that's what the, they want to make the point. Oh look, they're well rounded. They are, but in five, eight, nine years, will those be? Why would you? Why would you throw a spinner bait? You, you talked about Zaldin when he uh, when he interviewed the guys with showing their equipment. The part that bothered me about that, and I appreciate him doing that. Nothing about what he did bothered me. Right, about. I'm a big fan of Chris Zaldin. Yeah, I, I think he's awesome. But what bothered me was almost every single guy that he interviewed and talked about how many units they had and how many transducers they had and what their angles were. Almost every one of them apologized. Mm -hmm. They said, well, this is not what we like to do, but it's what we have to do. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, Brian New said, it, it ain't fishing. Was his, yeah. it ain't fishing. Yeah. And that bothers me there that you say, wait a minute. Uh, it's what I have to do. Right. I don't want fishing to be something that I have to do. I don't want a technique or a method to be something that I'm forced to do. I want it to be fun. I want to enjoy the sport. Well, you know, and I was thinking too, um, so can we all go back and forth? At what point does the technology start to control the sport or kind of put borders on what you can and can't do if you're saying you have to do this? It, it becomes more of a chore. And I feel like you're taking a broad sport and putting it down to you have to do this. That's really well said. It's taken a broad methods of all these different techniques and it's narrowing it down to just one method mm -hmm. that and again i will tell you that i'm not going to name any names at all mm -hmm. uh, uh of the anglers that are what we're terming today as scopers mm -hmm. uh and and not to throw off on me, I don't blame the pay if that's the rules man just for you you're not taking advantage of it so and to say these guys don't have talent, you know, the Gunnersville tournament, uh, these fish were in current, the wind was flowing, and the guy that won that tournament figured out in all that current how to get a bait presented to these fish that he could see on his scope. He figured out how in all that current and how much weight and how to rig that thing where that's really where the fish would bite it. And he's caught them in one. The time it right to get it yeah. down at the other end. He, that, that is fishing, man. That, and that's why he won. Everybody else could have done it. Did yeah, it. but he was the he was the guy. Right. His technique and his method. So there's good things. But again, it's as Sarah Beth said, it's taking this broad sport and it's, it's encapsulating it into a very narrow one method only. Mm-hmm. And so is there different baits? Yes. Is there different techniques? Yes. But it's all within the perimeter of that little scope. And I don't think that that's where our sport needs to head. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I'm not an authority. I am a guy that loves the sport, that's been a part of it for over 50 years, and I've never seen anything ever that threatened mm -hmm. The tradition that has been set in place, the experience that the sport brings, I've never seen anything threaten that until now. So that's why not wanting to be controversy, uh, controversial, not wanting to open up a can of worms, I felt it necessary. You and I talk behind the scenes. I know you feel strongly about preserving the sport. Mm -hmm. And so 
I want to engage in this thing to be fair. Right. And I think fair is important. And I think uh, I listened to, and again, I'm not going to name any names. I listened to a guy from my generation who I fished with myself personally. And I listened to his podcast and he's, his heart is pure in my opinion. I think he really cares about the sport. And I think he does a great job most of the time. But some of the time, he's discrediting these anglers, saying they're just one-dimensional and they have no ability. I don't think that that's fair. And I don't know that he really means that. He's so passionate about getting this stuff taken away to, to ban forward phase and so on as a whole. He's so passionate about it. Sometimes I think he gets a little bit uh, uh, overboard and uh, says some things that I don't agree with. And I'm not trying to find fault with him. I'm just trying to say that there's people that are very pro and there's people that are very con. And so I think it's, it's you got to be fair. you got to be fair at both sides. And to say that these guys don't have any fishing ability, that they just go out there and play computer games, that is completely on That's correct. And so that I, I think you got to get it in perspective. And I can't blame them for doing what they're doing. Uh, because they're trying to win, and that is the way to win. That is the way to win. So, so let's be very, very clear. I look to make sure because, see, I, I'm, 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 I'm your average guy, so I'm not sponsored. I can say what I look to say. I can, I can, I can represent what hurts me as an outdoorsman my whole life, who appreciates the sport, who grew up. It, it's the fabric of who I am. It's the fabric of the reason we see so much passion coming out. It's because we are all passionate about it. We love this. And this is more than a fish to us, right? So here's the deal. It hurts me when I see folks from your generation through to my generation and even now down below. Now I just feel like being pressured into trying to come out now and act and shame themselves or shame anyone who's not liking what they're seeing, that's rubbing. There's a reason why that passion is there. Now, to just beat up on these guys who are only doing it, that's wrong too. Yeah. Technology's here. What I want to see is a happy meeting. We've got to find out this can't be this dominant. And and what we need, we need to see some tournaments where if we were able to look at forward facing and say, well, at the end of the day, the what should have been shallower tournaments last year uh, if there were six of them, only two were one with forward facing. Well, then maybe you can say, well, okay, as long as the, you know, but that's not the case. Think about, I'll just say last year, we'll just use that. First two tournaments, everybody's watching our pistol are caught, right? And if we've got Okeechobee and Seminole, uh, it'll be irrelevant. What happened? Forward facing smoke at Seminole and Okeechobee. Let me tell you, I watched from Bathmore for Classic last year. And I had never heard the terminology sweeping. I go in, yep. and this is what I think I know. And I realize I don't know very much. I know that I go in there and I look for the bait balls. I look for the fish. I look for the bait balls to be broken up. And then I try to find the fish. And then I try to feed him a bait. And I, I do all this. And again, I stink. I, I'm not good at all. But I watched the guy that won the Bassmaster Classic. And again, I'm not going to name that him. Uh, sweeping. He's fishing in the canal between Teleco and Fort Loudon, and he's fishing that canal, and there ain't a fish to be seen. Not a fish. I'm sitting there looking at his screen. I'm doing the commentary, and I'm looking at his screen, and he's dragging this bait along the bottom, and these fish are so tight to the bottom. If there was a brick, there's current there. If there was a brick off the, off the bottom, that fish would be hiding behind that brick because that brick would defer the current around him, creating an eddy. So that's where he was, but you couldn't see him. So he was doing what he calls sweeping and uh, getting that fish to show himself. Then once that fish showed himself, then he would cast back and catch it. Brilliant. How awesome is that? But that is technology that blows me away. In the uh, but he's totally, absolutely, I watch. And again, I'm sitting there trying to make the show interesting by commenting. What can you say after about 20 minutes of nodding, picking your head up, just looking at the screen and, and, and casting? Well, 
that's just not very entertaining television. And they can say the ratings are higher than they ever been. I would argue that in the old TNN days, uh, Bass and Bill Downs and Hank Parker came on back to back if we were delivering three and four million households. So I don't think they're there today, and that's not their fault. That's the change in television. But I know the ratings are not what they used to be, and I'm not saying it's because of the methods or the techniques. It's just uh, the times are changed. So uh, the, the ratings are not nearly what they used to be because of the way television is today versus the way it was then. But the whole method of looking at a screen and casting without looking up, I don't care who you are, I would argue with that bit of entertainment. Listen, at, outside of fishing, if I meet you at church or in Walmart, I'm just respectful. I'm going to say, yes, sir. So I mean, you, yeah. you'd say, well, you're raised that way, right? So let's talk about respect. And that's what I think about right now. And, and again, just if you're watching this, you, you're like me. Now, the majority of the people are not like you, a professional angler, okay? It's, um, that's one, you know, two Bassmaster Classics and all of this stuff and all these accolades. But we love it. We love the sport. So I, it, it grieves me to see my other heroes, to see all of these men that have built this sport, the men that up until just a couple of years ago propped this sport up, that as a viewer on the outside watching, they're just kind of being passed by and almost being shamed a little bit. Uh, originally, when they were kind of speaking their minds on it, it hurts me to see that because... At the end of the day, prior to just a couple of years ago in technology, that is bass fishing. That's how these trophies were won. That's how these records are set. That's bass fishing, okay? And what we're seeing now with technology, I'll say it. I hope everybody just did it. That it it's, it's different, okay? And it is not traditional. So things change, right? So there's all of these arguments about that. So I'm not against it, but what I'm saying ultimately is this. There's got to be some parameters. we got to determine you cannot wipe away history. Records that you set, records that Kevin and all of these folks and Denny Brower and right on down the line that they set, even Jacob Wheeler now, you know, recently, these things are already, look at what happened, 10 century belts, the top 10. I think I, I don't remember, and I'll get this wrong, but maybe 40 ever, 42 or something in the history of bass prior to last week, and all 10 got century belts. Now, look, let's call that what it is. So, and, and meanwhile, all the guys that we've watched, all the guys that, that calls us to be drawn to bass fishing, all right, now, you know, are irrelevant. Should they learn? Should they adapt? You see these posts where people say, well, that's, that's what makes you better. You got to adapt. Shut up, won't it? I can get that at its core, but we're not adapting to learning how to grow a different type of spinnerbait. Or this. this is an entirely different beast that ultimately, I think, with the new wears off, when people like me get it, when they learn it, you will see the backside of this hurt. Yeah. I would say that kind of circles back around when y'all were saying earlier about the sense of entitlement in the new generation and the uh, saying, you know, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. That has kind of gone out the window. I mean, I've seen it in my own generation. People just don't have respect for for anybody, really, other than themselves and who's going to help me get by. Um, I think that might be the issue that a lot of people are kind of getting offended that there isn't, like, they're not giving credit where it's due to the people who built the sport and to what it's built on. They just see it as this is a new thing. This is helping. This is a, a new technological advance. We can market this. We can make money off of this. Yeah. And, and let me say, I, I'm not I'm not even worried about Blake Honeycutt's history, who is my hero. Uh, I'm not worried about Bobby Wary's history. I'm not worried about Rick Clarn's history. I'm not worried about... Uh, uh, Roland Martin's history. I'm not worried about Hate Parker's history. I'm worried about where we're going. If it's all about putting your face to that screen, and I'm trying to encourage high school fishermen to get out on the water and enjoy the sport. Exactly. I'm not seeing how 
staring at that screen all day is going to make you enjoy the experience. And I talked about the foundation of fishing to me was preparation, going out behind the chicken hut, digging worms, and the bobbers blowing in the wind, and watching when you get to the pond, watching that cork go under the thrill of the feel on the other end of the line. The whole experience has value. And when you narrow it down, as Sarah Beth said, you're taking a very broad sport and you're narrowing it down to one lane. You're taking an eight-lane highway and narrowing it down to one lane. You know how that backs traffic up? If yeah. If you've been in Atlanta, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, that's what concerns me. So I don't think that any of the electronic companies had any idea of what was going to happen. I don't think... At least I didn't, as it was explained to me by the company that I work with, where we're going with this. I don't think anybody saw what was happening. And I'll be honest with you, I have learned so much about fish behavior that I didn't know. I had no idea that the giant bats pull out. They don't go up in that shallow water necessarily to spawn like the three and four pounders do. Uh, they they stay out in deeper water. I didn't realize that their period of actually moving up and spawning was so short. They go up, boom, they're fat. I didn't realize when a cold front came that they just pulled out. I just thought maybe they didn't bite. Man, they pull out there and suspend. We're learning all of that because forward facing sonar. Who knew all of that? But now here's a second concern. Fish get no break. Before, right. when they pulled out in that 20 to 30 foot of water, suspended 10, 11 foot deep, nobody knew they were there. You couldn't find them. And so they had a sanctuary. They had a refuge. They had they had a timeout. And now there is no timeout. Now there is no refuge. Now there is no sanctuary. There's no escape. So they can run or they can swim but they cannot hide. I don't know what that's going to do to the future. I, You know, I, I fished in a lake several years ago that was a trophy bass lake. Well, the fish got harder to catch, so they started catching live bream and put live bream on a Carolina rig. And I told them, I said, guys, you will absolutely destroy your fishery. These fish will go into a, they'll be intimidated beyond belief. You, you, they get to the point they won't bite artificial because they're fished so heavily, they're intimidated. Now you're going to take their natural prey and you're going to make that a weapon against them. They were just shut down and absolutely, sure enough, within a year, they told me that these fish are losing weight, they're skinny as a rail, and they will bite nothing. They ruined it. They absolutely destroyed that trophy lake by using live bream because the fish had no escape. What is that going to do to our fisheries? What is it going to do in the future? There are already states looking at, can we allow this because the harvest is so much greater than it's ever been. Now everybody that has this technology is going out and they're catching fish. But you know, that affects so much more than just the bass population too. I mean, think about the animals that feed on bass. You know, as bass populations dwindle down, that becomes a whole other issue of ecosystem and keeping your ecosystem intact. I mean, you're completely right. At what point do they start learning that behavior and start adapting to, okay, I don't want to get hooked in the mail. This is a danger to me. I can't eat this anymore. So that they are going to join. So here's a training. So so you hear now when that's brought up, nonsense. It, it ain't going to hurt. Studies have shown this. Studies have shown that. It doesn't hurt. I disagree. I just disagree. And I'm going to tell you why. We're just getting into it. I don't care if what a study five years. Well, Ford Pace been out seven years, so they did the study. Go, Listen, that's inaccurate. It's just because it even, even it's changing every 30 days. Anglers like me, there's still so many of us. The pros have got really good with it, and they can absolutely ripple uh, a lot of them anyway. But it, you're still going to need two and five and seven years for guys like me to get better and better and better at it. And and to think 
that those fish that used to go out and suspend, Mother Nature has a way of sustaining herself. Yes, and you just nailed it, right? So, so these bass got where they wouldn't even eat, they wouldn't even eat live bait. So then people say, "We'll see you there." So then these bass will get tired of seeing these little jig head minnows, and they'll get used to hearing the way they can out what that's doing. So then when a guy like me goes out, or, or just a good old guy that, that makes fishing, they can't even catch a bass as difficult enough as it is. You can't just go into something and say, oh, it'll be okay. That's not, if you're an outdoorsman, and you're a true outdoorsman, you cannot turn a blind eye with that. You can't just go and say, well, I've got, I've got in the state of Georgia, I think we've got 12 deer tags. Well, hey, I could kill 10 does, the state says, so I'm just going to kill my 10 does every year, period. If legitimately every license that was sold in the state did that, but, but it would absolutely deplete the population. So as true sportsmen, we've got to look at that, and we've got to say legitimately what it's doing. So it all goes back to this. Number two, that what is bass fishing, and where are the parameters? And right now, there are none and there's got to be some. And then third, it goes back to what you said. It's not a leather playing field. Let's look at these young people. We cannot discourage them. They don't need to feel like they've got to be able to make a $100,000 investment to be able to follow and pursue this passion. If that's the standard we set and that's what we build, guys, we are going to shoot ourselves in the foot. Well, if you look back to our sounder, uh, our bass, Ray Scott, before Ray... It was 100% the reason you went fishing was to catch fish and bring them home and clean them and have a fish fry. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was everything. No one ever threw a fish back. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the states finally came up and regulated. They had to be 12 inches long to keep them, or people would keep every single thing they caught because that's what you were there for. So then as Ray saw this as a detriment, as more and more people became advanced and knowledgeable on how to catch fish, if there wasn't a catch and release program, we would completely deplete the resources. So Ray mandated catch and release. Forrest Wood built the first aerated live reel in a bass boat to be able to keep uh, your catch alive. And how important that became, and it set a precedent. And you say, well, I'm in the minority, only 5% of the people are professional fishermen. But those 5% have the influence on the entire marketplace. Those 5% are the ones that created catch and release. They're the ones that made that a reality because people look up and they set the, the standard for all the other anglers. It's the same today. And so now we got another hot topic. Are we going to kill our catch? No. Are we going to narrow this broad sport down to a narrow sport? I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly where that's going. But somebody has to look at this thing and analyze it for what it is. And again, go back and be fair. I don't want to penalize the electronic companies that have worked so hard. But I don't even think they knew how big a deal this thing was going to become. I don't think they knew how it was going to revolutionize and completely change the sport. Right. Well, I mean, and that just circles back around to there's pros and cons of it. And I feel like it is something that needs to be talked about, if not more of a warning or like spread more awareness on it. Because, I mean, people aren't really thinking about it. It's just, oh, this is something new, innovation. Then guess what? 20 years from now, it's, well, the bats population is going to go down X amount of numbers. And who's to say that they're going to put laws on what you can and can't fish? Yeah. So I'm going to think that's, that's good. Well, real estate, let me do one like lot of what? Give me your last point. Technology. You know, technology's always been there. What's the deal? Number one, we've got to acknowledge and understand this. Never anything this dominant. It is absolutely sweeping it. It's making even the the guys that have been pros realize, I am not going to have a job in another year or two if I don't learn just to do just this. We know that. And so that number two, technology's been around, but is there a difference between sight? You know, you, you scout over a point, you see a school of bass and sight imaging, and Put a dot there, mark around for under those bass, mark in a brush pile through under those bass, uh, and live it. You know, there's I, I see these comparisons. Try, oh, what's the fuss? Take, oh, you didn't fuss when Zyde Energy came out. Listen, there is a difference. There is a difference between the live sonar. You spend, I mean, if you don't believe it, if you watch tournaments and pockets, I've seen guys win tournaments put their head down, 
and literally just put the trailer on a high, and they're going, and they're sweeping, and they're sweeping, and just, they're just looking. Finally, they see it, they stop. Now they've got, you know, we've got things on the back of the power poles to stop it in the back of the boat so we don't mess it up. Never look up ever. Make a cast. So at your heart, I don't care who says what, if you're at your soul, you're a bass fisherman, and you're watching that, you know. There's a lot of people I deal with, both in my rental businesses and, and life and poise and, and, and across the board. There's times in my life I look people in the face and I say, look at me just a minute. You can say what you want to say or do what you want to do, but when all the tips fall, you know, you know right here whether or not this is right as it is. There's got to be something that changes. If you don't believe it, I have five units on my boat. When I pull up to a gas station and another man pulls up, they think I'm the plane, you know, good grace, what they jumped the boat. So when you look at this, you know right here. So if you're watching this and you we're prone to automatically say what we've seen on social media, that's why AI is scary. Because if we say it enough, you could convince people to think certain things. Stop all that. You look into this camera and you ask yourself, at its core, is this right? Is this what bass fishing is? And that's what the fuss is over. You answer that for yourself. Right, my, my final words would be, I don't think that we should take a broad sport and narrow it down, but that's my opinion. I don't think that we should take the experience of fishing out of play to be effective to look at a screen all day. I don't think that putting four and five transducers or forward facing around the boat is good method for tournament fishing, personally. But I don't think that we should be criticizing the guys that are doing it. Thumbs up to you guys, because I think you're taking advantage of the opportunities to be the most competitive you can. And I respect you. Yeah. I don't say anything negative. I respect the electronic companies that develop it. I don't think anybody foresaw where this thing is leading to. And we're just like Danny has said, to say this goes back seven years, I, I don't see that. I don't know where that came in. It, it's been in play now for about three years. And it's just in its it stage. Where it's going to go, that is scary to me. And I'm trying so hard to get the generation of high school fishermen to appreciate the experience, to learn to read the water to learn to use your mind and and figure out fish patterns and the things to develop appreciation for the whole sport and not make it too narrow. So my fear is we're taking a wonderful sport and we're narrowing it down to the point that it's going to change everything. That steers me for the future. And I'm not whining. Because I'm not competing, and it's not changing my world. And I'm not worried. I'm an old man. I'm going to die soon. I'm not in this thing for the land hall, but I care. I care about my grandkids. I care about our future. I care about the future of the sport of fishing. I don't want to see it tainted in any way, and I certainly don't want to see it destroyed. And I'm not panicking that the sky is falling. But I see danger here, and I think fairness is something that needs to be considered, and I think we need to approach this thing in a very serious frame of mind because it is threatening, and we'll see where it goes from here. I agree. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, buddy. Good to see you. Thank you, Thank you sweetheart. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for uh, for watching or listening to our podcast. Thank you for what you do for us. We need you to go up there on that YouTube and, and subscribe. <laughs> and uh, every time you watch, if you like it, hit that like button, man. We appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you uh, on our next podcast uh, coming up soon. So uh, from Daddy Bennett, tell him bye, Daddy. See y'all later. We enjoyed it. Okay, sir, F, your turn. See y'all next week. All right. God bless you. I'm Hay Parker. House needs painting.
Hillcrest. It's moving. Where is he at? Hi, this is Hank. Sorry I missed your call. Leave me your name and your number and I'll get back to you. He's gone fishing. <laughs>